Hey, what's going on everyone? Welcome back to Take Like Raj. Rocking a 944 t-shirt off Amazon. <laughs> um, okay, so I was going back and forth in my head on how to arrange this video. Should I do it as a series? Should I do it as um, just one big shebang? And I decided ultimately I'm going to break it up into two parts. So today we're going to be talking about suspension. Um, similar to the brake setup, right? So we're going to dive into a bunch of different topics. I'm going to cover what's the purpose of even upgrading the suspension on the car. Is it necessary even? Is it just a waste of money? Um, and I'll, I'm going to talk about the front and rear suspension setups, the differences between some of the cars. I'll give you an, a brief overview of that in case you're unaware between, you know, the, uh, the differences in model years and uh, an offset suspension, um, the struts, the types of struts, all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about all that. And uh, I did put together a little bit of a montage of me, you know, sort of just doing a little bit of work on the rears. We got the rears all set up. We have the fronts that still need to be um, installed. It's a little bit more of an involved process. So I'll do that separately. I'll probably end up doing it off camera, but like I said, I'm still going to um, talk about those um, key differences and key points and give you some helpful pointers, hopefully. So without further ado, let me go ahead and flip the camera. Let me show you what's on the bench, show you what's in the car, and uh, let's get right into it. Okay, so I figured we'll save the philosophy stuff for the end. Let's just dive right into the information. So here we have the front strut inserts for the 944s. Um, everything that's non-turbo or uh, non-S, and I believe the 87. Um, I believe the 87 base cars as well, because they the 87 and I want to say the 88s have a, a bit of a different offset from, for example, the 85 and a half and 86 cars. So again, I'm not too well versed in those. So just brush up on your homework a little bit more in addition to this video and make sure that you're hundred percent sure on what your car is based on, you know, what your, what model you have and when your car was built and all that other kind of good stuff, what spec it is. So I have an easy car. Some of you out there might be confused as to like this. You might have heard something called cut a strut. Like what's the deal with the cut a strut? In the early cars um, up to 86 before there's a change in offset. If you have these struts, which are not sealed units. So if you can see right there, there's, a, there's threads and then there's this cap. This whole unit can be disassembled um, in fact, you can even do it without messing with your alignment by just dropping the sway bar. We can pull this down. This is the method that I'm gonna go with when uh, I end up doing this. Disconnect the sway bar, um, disconnect everything from the engine bay, and you can swing this whole assembly out, use spring compressors, tilt this all forward and out, unscrew this cap, and inside this assembly here, inside the strut housing, see if I can get a better view, there we go. Inside this entire unit is the shock cartridges. Come on, focus. So these are replaceable. So the earlier cars have a serviceable um, shock housing, right? So they, all you gotta do is disassemble them. They can be opened up and you only need to replace the actual shock cartridge itself. You don't have to go through and replace the entire um, suspension housing or the the actual strut itself that holds the spring and all that other kind of stuff now things get different when you move to say an aftermarket there's a good example of it right here 
things get a little bit different if um, you have the conies, which I don't even think they make anymore, but the they used to make housings where you would swap the entire housing. So this second bolt right here, one of them controls your caster and I believe the other one controls your camber. So, or actually it might, yeah, yeah, not toe or anything like that, just caster and camber, right? So the angle of your wheel and how it tucks under your fender and that affects your alignment. So when you start messing with that, then you need to worry about doing an alignment. But again, with these, with the strut inserts like this, we're not worried about that because it's serviceable. On the turbo cars, on I believe the 87s, the 88s, where they changed it, it's a sealed unit. So this whole strut tower is one sealed thing. You can't get in there. So if you want to replace it, you have to end up replacing the entire thing. There's no way around it. Um, you know, you got to worry about alignment and, and all that other kind of stuff. So the cut a strut method is where you effectively cut your factory sealed units, your sealed housings, so that you can insert the Coney cartridges. Now that's a whole method. There's a whole process to that. They have several videos um, themselves showing how to perform that method. Um, and then um, there's also a number of uh, YouTube videos specifically for the 944 that kind of show the cut a strut method and uh, how to do it, how to perform it. Basically got to drain the fluid out, drill it, measure, cut so that you can remove the lid, take the gas cartridge out, put it back in. It's all a bit of an involved process. So that's what the cut a strut method is. That's what you're hearing. It really depends on what year your car is, if you have sealed cartridges or if you don't. And um, yeah, pray <laughs> if you want to do this and uh, you want to be like me and are lazy about stuff, pray that you've got the replaceable serviceable units. That's one reason why I love the early cars is because you can just undo some stuff, throw these in, and you've got fresh shocks. These are adjustable as well, so you can change the stiffness of the shocks as well as the rear ones. So what does that mean? So these come with, um, that's what this little kit is right here. These come with these knobs and you can see there's a little plus and a minus on there. So based on how you turn that knob, you can either stiffen or relax the stiffness of the suspension, which is kind of cool. So basically it's the same thing as what you would do in a modern day card when you enter sport mode, or if you have, let's, uh, let's use Porsche terms here. If you have PASM, and you have your active suspension management, you click that little button and your suspension stiffens, right? It changes your spring, not your spring rate, but your um, dampening and uh, shock values so that the car stiffens up. And why do you want stiffer suspension? Better handling, better grip, all that other kind of stuff, which we'll talk about towards the end about, um, you know, the whole philosophy thing. But that's, that's what this is. This is basically like a very crude chasm button <laughs> except you just got to pop a hood and do it now the rear suspension let's go ahead and talk about that real quick the rear suspension you have options there's coilover kits that are out there i find that for a street car coilovers are totally unnecessary now i might be biased because this car's got uh was optioned with rear sway bars but truth be told in my 83 that didn't have the rear sway bars I never really saw a reason to jettison the trailing arm suspension like this and go with coilovers on the back. Maybe if you're doing a full out raw track build or if you're doing a rally build and you need something custom, it makes sense. But if you're just doing, you know, if you're streeting your 944, if it's a, you know, a weekend car, a weekend cruiser, a back road crusher, these conies are going to be plenty. Uh, you can go as far as, you know, you can go further and, and do some poly bushings here in the rear. I think these are going to be plenty stiff. These are also adjustable. I've left everything um, and I plan on leaving the front struts in the medium setting because the medium um, setting is already, it's, it's pretty stiff. <laughs> it's, uh, it's nowhere, it's more than what the car power wise is. Uh, it's, it's not going to exceed that threshold. So, and these are really easy. Part of the reason why I didn't even bother showing you this. I'll give you some tips here real fast. Let's, let's go ahead and talk about what's going on back here. So you got one 19 millimeter nut up here. 
um, with a, uh, another 19 mil on the other side. It's back up there and it's really dark, so I can't show you. But, and then down here, it's just one single 22. I'm pretty sure this is the same for all the cars. Uh, regardless of model year, it's the front struts that change up a little bit. I could be mistaken on that. So again, that's just one of those things where I haven't owned a turbo or an S or an S2. So if you have one of those cars, just do a little bit of extra homework, maybe check Clark's garage, check the forums and uh, double check and see exactly what all is entailed with your rear suspension. But for the early cars, 83 up to 86, I can confirm that aside from a slight difference in how the strut mounts uh, and the um, the trailing arm assembly, it's it, it's pretty much identical. Just literally four bolts. One, two on this side, three and four on the other side. Pull the other one out, pop the new one in, make sure it's adjusted properly and you're good. So that's as far as the install goes. There's really not much to talk about there. So let me go ahead, flip the camera on one more time and let's talk about why is this, like why do this? What's the whole point? You know, or is this just another one of those flashy things to say, hey, look at, you know, this money I wasted on my car. It really isn't. And uh, I'll explain right now why. Okay. okay, forgive me for the crude setup, but we got the mini 944 out here. We're all 944 out in this video. Um, so let's talk about the philosophy, right? So a lot of people think that you just tune suspension because that's just what everyone does, especially if you're a kid, right? Well, I'm going to spend my money on that because that's what everyone says to go do. Uh, I want to talk about why people do that, how to do it, the proper way to do it, and just sort of explain some basic concepts to you. So um, we need to understand three things when it comes to suspension tuning. Understeer, oversteer, and neutral handling. Understeer is when the car is set up so that if you enter a corner with uh, too much inertia, too much speed, if the car is loaded, in a specific way where the outer rear tire is going to have more grip than the outer front tire the car is basically it's the front tire is going to slip and no matter how much you turn the rear tire is going to keep you uh going straight it's going to keep you stable during um you know in, in a situation where we have too much speed or the car is uh, uh too much momentum into a corner you can't slow down fast enough so what does this mean? Well, it, even if you hit something or if you lock up, basically no matter how much you turn the wheel in either direction, the car is gonna keep going in a straight uh, path. So what does that mean? Well, it means that it's safe, right? You're not spinning out, you're not losing control, you're not gonna go sideways into a wall, you're gonna hit something from the front or the rear where the crumple zones are. That's why uh, a lot of stock passenger car suspensions are set up this way it's set up for you to understeer um you know if you've seen a lot of crashes right you hear people just skid lock up but they still go straight into whatever they're hitting even if they hit something they're not doing it sideways right they're not gonna spin out into uh, a position that's potentially worse to end up in a collision in it also means you're not wildly out of control in uh whatever scenario is going on, right? If you're in the track or if you're, you know, you don't want to wildly be sliding into something. So understeer is the safest thing. Oversteer is a lot less safe. It's more fun, right? <laughs> but um, oversteer is essentially where the opposite happens, where the rear wheels lose grip and the front wheels maintain more grip. So what happens in that scenario? call that the ass end sliding out, right? You'll feel the back end of the car sort of pull out. Um, if you've ever locked up in a 944, because of the 50-50 uh, weight distribution, there's a certain threshold where you you will start to feel, the car's gonna understeer, and then you'll start to feel it, not snap oversteer, but you start to feel it oversteer where the back end will sort of come loose, right? I had this happen to me a couple times. I had one scenario where, um, after doing the front suspension on my car because it was so set up for oversteer um i was coming through an intersection there was an old gentleman that was turning left into a parking lot and uh the guy just flat out pulled out in front of me no there's like he just straight up looked at me and then pulled out in front of me 
So I went full lock, which if I was a better driver, I would have pumped the brakes and tried to stop in time. But I went full lock because I had the Coney's up front. The front wheels maintain more grip than the rear wheels. So he's coming this way. Imagine he's turning out in front of me. I locked up. The car swung this way. And I was actually able to steer the car around the accident that would have been. And I managed to just miss the nose of his car and catch the 944 in a drift. It sounds like a made up story. I swear to God, it's not. I wish I had photo evidence of this. But I managed to drift the car around the nose of his and recover control and keep going. So that's that's the reason why cars are so set up for understeer so that you can sort of catch it and with a 944 it's such an intuitive car to really pick out how it's going to behave you know like you can you can immediately right away you'll start to feel the back end uh loosen up and you can catch it and that's the whole thing with drifting you know if you catch the car and you either maintain it with power or that momentum you kind of break that traction and give that traction back to those rear wheels you can catch it and you can try to save it now, if you're going 100 miles an hour and you just understeer straight and wall, there's, you know, there's no recovering that. So what about neutral handling? Neutral handling is just exactly what it sounds like. It's There's no understeer or, or oversteer. You can carry the car through a corner. So for example, if you're going straight through a corner, you don't want body roll, right? You just want the car to be planted. You want all corners of the car to have equal amounts of grip so that you just keep going. You keep accelerating through that corner. So herein lies suspension tuning, right? What's the best setup? Do I want understeer? Do I want oversteer? What's the best way to go about this? The best thing to do, the safest way to do it is to keep a certain level of understeer there, right? Because it's just, it's for a street car. Now, as you start to get comfortable, if you're a track guy, um, then you probably want something closer to a neutral handling setup because if the car does oversteer, you can catch it and you can save it. Um, 911s are notorious for having all that weight over the rear and losing traction in the front. That's why if you lift off, if you take that grip away from the rear end of the car, you get that snap oversteer. 944s are a much more neutral handling car, um, but you can still get a 944 to break loose. Uh, but the thing is, is that a 944 is much easier to recover. It's much more, you can tell it's going to happen before it happens and you can kind of catch it before it happens. Okay. There's the whole spiel. So why do this, right? What's the whole point? The point of having, first of all, healthy suspension, not blown out shocks is so that the car can a not transfer, like it, it can safely transfer any upset in balance, right? So when you're going down the highway, and you go over something heavy or a bump and you upset enough grip, if you do that, if you upset the weight of the car enough, you can end up in a scenario where you'll lose traction on that wheel and whatever has more traction or less can kind of upset the balance of the car. So having healthy suspension in the first place, not even performance suspension, is there to keep you safe and uh, you know uh, literally absorb those shocks. That's why they're called shock absorbers. So if the car doesn't get upset in a serious way. Now going with something like a stiffer suspension, at that point you're, you're raising the threshold of where the car is gonna lose grip. So if you have a stiffer shock, the car is gonna stay more planted and it's gonna give you more grip. So where if you're, let's say you're in second gear and you'd start to kind of lose grip or understeer, um, if you're just kind of mashing the throttle, you're gonna get more grip and you can kind of accelerate. You're gonna, the car's gonna push through more because there's more um, of a tire contact patch because the car is not sort of lip, lifting or unloading or shifting weight. You can, the car is able to handle a bit more of a weight transfer with the stiffer shocks and the stiffer um, suspension setup. Now you can still, even with stiffer shocks, tune the car, right? Do you want the front end uh, more stiff than the rear? You want the rear end more stiff than the front? Are you gonna set the car up for understeer, set the car up for oversteer? Again, it all depends. It depends on what kind of driver you are, what kind of driver you're doing. Um, there's a lot of factors, there's a ton of factors that go into it. 
I haven't done all four corners before. I, I don't know how the car is going to behave. This is going to be kind of a new thing for me. But with everything being adjustable, I can take the car out, drive it, sort of get comfortable with how the car is going to behave and go from there, right? If I think that I need to loosen up the rear end a little bit and uh, maintain a little bit more of an understeer setup, I'll do that if I think that that's what's best. When I got hit, I was able to avoid the car in front of me. Think about that. I'm going from zero to 30, 40 miles an hour instantly due to weight transfer of a, you know, six ton truck or four ton truck. All of that's getting shot into the car and then all of a sudden I had to jerk the wheel, right? Because I was able to maintain that grip with the stiffer shocks up front, the car didn't just understeer and go straight into the car in front of me. I was able to steer around the accident that would have been uh, in front. So instead of hitting the guy, I was able to nose the car over. Now, granted, I had enough space to do that. I mean, if you're bumper to bumper the car, it doesn't matter how good your suspension setup is, you're still gonna hit what's in front of you. So I had enough space to be able to steer around that and still steer out of it. So ultimately, do you need coilovers? Do you need, you know, a full performance race track setup? No, it depends. Depends on your tires, depends on your wheel setup, depends on the kind of driving that you're doing and all that kind of stuff. There's a common theme here. But I think that it's for, from a safety standpoint of view, yeah, you need good suspension from the get-go. I think, uh, I personally like the Coney's because I like the sport suspension. I like the fact that I can get a little bit deeper in the throttle in the corners. Um, I like the fact that it's adjustable, it's tunable. So that's the appeal of the Coney's themselves. Do you need Coney's? No, you can go with Bill Steen's. Coney has different shock setups, not just the yellows. The yellows are their sport. Uh, that's how they're marketed, their sport line, because they're adjustable. They have detuned, you know, softer suspension setups. If you're on a GT car, do you really need, you know, do you want to get like hard jolted every time you go over a bump? No, that's, it's, you know, it's the same thing with stiffening up the chassis. There's a lot of stuff that you can do to your car, but if you're not tracking it, it's like completely unnecessary. So anyways, yeah, I hope I've done my best to just give you a broad overview of the concepts and like, okay, so what's the purpose of this really? Do I really need to do it? Um, I hope that, you know, kind of giving you a sort of visual between understeer and oversteer here kind of gives you an idea. This is the best way I thought to do it without getting in the car and, and hooning it around. So that brings me to the segue of what part two is going to be. Part two, after we get the car all set up, is I'll take it out for a drive. And I now have three years driving on the old shocks, which uh, weren't originals. I know that they were replaced at some point, but they were old enough. Um, I have experience, you know, five years experience with the other car and uh, I have experience of what it's like to be in a situation where you're not going straight. So uh, we'll take the car out. I'll try to get a camera mount and we'll do a quick blast. Um, I have a road that I think will be a good, uh, good sort of running ground to really show you the suspension travel and how the car is behaving and, and all that other kind of stuff. And I'll talk about, you know, the dynamics, what's different, what do I notice that's different and share that with all of you. So, um, I hope that you found this video informative and, uh, yeah, let me know if you have any comments or questions. If I said anything that you think was, uh, wrong or, uh, that I probably need that I didn't do a good job elaborating on, feel free. I, I have no shame. I got no pride. Go ahead. Let me know. Rip me apart in the comments and, um, list resources. I think that's the best thing. If you're looking for a resource on this clock's garage, if you're a 944 guy has, you know, a great explanation of, of all of this and, um, you know, do your homework, watch your engineering videos, all that other kind of stuff. Don't just take my word for it. So I just wanted to include this little segment in here as to like, okay, so what's the purpose of this, right? Because it's, it's easy for me to just like, hey, look, check it out. We got some cool conies. Let's throw it on the car and it's rad, right? But why? What's the purpose of it? So, uh, and you guys already know that this car for me is um, everything I've done, everything I've touched has been, there's been a reason for it. There's seldom been um, things that I've touched on this car that were just, well, you know, let me spend a little bit of money and post that on YouTube and, and show off what I got. No, everything has been very purpose driven. Um, which I think is how a lot of Porsche ownership goes, right? You're, if you're buying a car, it's for a specific purpose. You know, you want a car to take to the track and go get groceries in it. 
you know, you want to build it to you and, and your individual needs. And that's, that's what I think appeals to all of us, not just as car enthusiasts, but as specifically as Porsche enthusiasts and as very specifically 944 enthusiasts. I think that's what the appeal of the car is, is it's a blank canvas to tune it to what we want. It can be a track car, can be a grocery getter, can be a canyon carver, can be a weekend car, can be a show car, can be a daily driver. So thanks for watching you guys and I will see you in part two whenever it comes out.